Anyway. All right. Hey, hey, everybody. Sorry about the late start. There's always a technical issue. <laughs> here we here we are in our time zone, Eastern yes. Seaboard of the United States. I'm in Cleveland. Aaron's in Florida. Yeah, I'm in Orlando. Nice, hot, sunny Florida. That's That's awesome. Nice, but it was it snowed here in Cleveland last night. So. <laughs> 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 well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, the special Zoom and live Facebook presentation where um, the SKB Foundation, Susan Kathleen Black Foundation, does a big workshop every fall out in Dubois, Wyoming. And every year they have a featured artist that... Um, and this year, Aaron is the featured artist. Well, Aaron's a friend of mine, artist buddy of mine, been friends for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, I happen to know a lot about how Aaron works. And so I, but the thing about Aaron is that Aaron is an animator par excellence. He's a longtime Disney artist who did, worked on all of the biggest films that you sat and ate popcorn in front of. <laughs> and um, uh, he's just a genius on the uh, his big Cintiq tablet. I have an iPad. His his working surface is big. like a drive-in movie theater. <laughs> it is. And uh, so what I thought we would do today is introduce you, those of you who know Aaron. A lot of you don't know Aaron, and I'm hoping today you'll get to know him a little better because he is... Uh, to me, he's a very remarkable uh, artist, a 21st century artist. I, as an artist and a traditional watercolor painter, I also have a lot of skill set in computers and digital imaging. It's nothing like Aaron. Aaron, <laughs> Aaron is way, way. Uh, beyond, I don't know about that. Beyond, I... He's beyond anybody that I know. <laughs> and um, so I thought I would show you because... <clears throat> He has both the ability to draw and paint in all kinds of mediums. And then in addition, he has this remarkable ability to put it into the digital world and even have it end up as a feature length animated movie. <laughs> and uh, it's a really complete package. And uh, Aaron, one of the things that people like, might like to know is when you were first starting out, did you go to art school or did what did you do for your early training? Yeah, let me. Well, actually, I'll back up even f further from there. I grew up in South Florida, down in the Everglades. We lived in a little trailer, and I was just this little Tarzan kid that loved running around out in the Everglades, out in the woods. I was always barefoot, chasing animals. Always loved drawing animals. Always had a sketchbook with me, and so you know that's what I. That was my introduction to to drawing animal, doing animal art and nature art and all of that. I just couldn't get enough of it. And as I grew up, you know, kind of I kept under my bed all these stacks of National Geographic. And that was my kind of my window to the world and all these great adventures that I wanted to do. And I would lay in bed and I'd read these magazines every night. <clears throat> but one of the, my favorite things going through those magazines were the illustrations and the fold outs and all that stuff. And I just absolutely loved them. And so by the time I got into high school... I thought, you know what, that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to illustrate for National Geographic and also be an animal painter. So I was kind of pursuing two different things. So I went to the Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida, um, uh, and, uh, and majored in illustration. So this is back in the mid 80s. And, uh, you know, back then there really wasn't any kind of digital art. So I, everything was traditional. And uh, so I, I wanted to be a painter and I learned all the traditional art like everyone else did. I, you know, and it, I had a strong foundation in drawing and painting figurative stuff, but I also continued to pursue my, my love of, of uh, you know, animal art and applied that to my illustration work. And, you know, it was watercolor, oil, acrylic, charcoal, all that stuff I was trained in. Um, but then I found out that National Geographic freelanced everything and I was supporting myself, trying to get myself through school and I didn't want to freelance anymore. I wanted to find a staff position. So I decided to kind of change my, my direction and see what else might be out there. And, uh, lucky for me, you know, it's, it's a great, it, it's all timing. Right. And I just happened to be in the right point in history 
And um, and so at this point, Disney was trying to ramp up again. They they had talked about shutting down in the early '80s, uh, but they wanted to start making films again, animated films, and 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 uh, kind of expand the studio. And they were going across the country looking for interns. And um, and I thought it might be an interesting job. You know, I never thought about animation. Maybe I'd be a background painter. And so I submitted a portfolio of of uh, figurative drawings. And animal drawings, that's what they were looking for. And not cartoons. They wanted to see traditional, you know, uh, well-drawn figurative work and animal drawings. And so that's what I put together. And they liked it. And I was accepted. You know, there was about eight of us from across the country that were accepted. And I got into this program with Disney to learn how to animate and, and, and make animated movies. And I remember getting together. I was mentored by an animator named Glenn Keane, who's probably one of the top contemporary animators in the world right now and uh he's just a, an amazing not just an amazing artist but a really amazing human being very passionate very uh inspiring and i remember sitting in his office when i was 19 years old when i just started this internship and he's talking about you know he had come from the same background as me he wanted to be a painter and kind of fell into animation and discovered all the all the possibilities of animation with acting and music and and you know choreography and, and but also drawing and putting it all together and it, it was i you know after 10 minutes of talking with him i realized that was what i wanted to do for the rest of my life and so that was 35 years ago so and, wait a minute wait a minute you you are you finish up at ringling yeah was was disney your first big job yeah yeah i started i i actually had the job at Disney before I graduated from school. I went through the internship and they hired me and I still had a year of school. So I went back to school and finished and they actually let me leave school early. And I started at Disney uh, like uh, three weeks after my 21st birthday. That's yeah. great. Yeah, it was, it was very lucky, very, very lucky. And, um, and in that, in that period, you know, that was back, you know, that 1989, that's the big renaissance, the second renaissance of, of Disney animation. And, uh, you know, that's when we did Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King and, and uh, Pocahontas and Mulan and Aladdin and all these films. And, and, um, and we really grew as artists and as animators and as filmmakers. And, and uh, it was an amazing time in just animation history for us. And uh, when you came in, when time. you first started, did they give you all the schlep work? Oh, oh yeah. Really oh yeah. You start stuff. at the bottom, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. Definitely. And, uh, and that was fine. You know, it was, it was, we were, we were just happy to be there. We were all young and, uh, and just wanted, we had something to prove, you know, we wanted to do really well. And so we, we really, I remember spending, you know, 70, 80 hours a week in that studio, uh, making films and, and, uh, kind of working my way up through the ranks. I remember when, you know, one of the animators left the studio and it left a hole. It's like, oh, I want to get that. I want to get that position. And and a whole bunch of us put together, you know, animation tests so that we could get promoted to animator. And I was lucky enough to be the guy that they picked. And that was right before Beauty and the Beast. And uh, from there, you know, we just continued to grow. And, and we went from a studio of about 75 people up to, you know, 400 people over 15 years. And, and uh, it was just, it was an amazing experience so how long when did you leave disney so uh they ended up shutting down the studio in florida in the early 2000s they decided to downsize the studio a little bit and a lot of my co-workers were laid off but i was held on to i had a i had just directed a movie called brother bear so i'd kind of grown into directing and i directed a film called brother bear and that was out and i had another i had made another deal with Disney to uh, create another film. And so I moved to California to their studio there. And I was there for six years developing another movie. But it was during that period that my wife passed away from breast cancer and kind of lost my, I really didn't have any desire to be at the studio world anymore after, after a little bit and ended up leaving in 2010 to kind of find a new direction. And uh, so here we are <laughs> 12 years yeah. later. And your new, you, this is a new studio for you, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I ended up going to another studio for a short period, about three years, but that studio went bankrupt. And uh, so then I was out on my own and I really didn't, I, I was done. I'd spent 20, 
24 years in the studio world and was kind of done with it. And I had and the other thing too, I forgot to mention is during this period, I had kept up my, my, my painting career as well. So I was, I was showing in galleries and, and, and doing, and that's where David and I met. I joined the society of animal artists. And so I was still drawing and, and painting animals along with my animation career. Um, but uh, so as I, when I left, the studio world after that the the second studio went bankrupt i decided to kind of go back to my roots but also i started looking about looking at the technology that you know was around nine years ago and, you know youtube had just come out and the ability to share all this information um has was starting to sprout and i thought man you know i could give young people coming into the industry now i could give them such a head start if i could share my experiences in a way that you know, Glenn Keane did with me in a one on one basis, I can do it, you know, through social media, I can do it all over the world. And so that's where the idea for our my business came from. And also, the other thing that was driving me crazy was the cost of tuitions in college. You know, when I went to school, I think a year at Ringling was was $8,000. It's over $50,000 now. And so I just thought, you know, what? there's got to be some kind of at least a supplemental alternative for people that just can't fork out that kind of cash. There's no, you know, I feel very strongly that no one should miss out on education because they can't afford it. That's just annoying. Well, looking at the, because I'm familiar with what you've been doing for the last several years. Yeah. And I'm also familiar with your skill set. Um, I, the, the fact that you actually spend time helping people learn how to draw better. Right me is the bedrock of the art world. So many artists today don't think that they need to know how to draw. <laughs> so, and you know, as long as they can hit the canvas with a gob of paint, yeah. they figure that they're an artist. But the ability to draw, you spend a lot of time on that because without those abilities to draw and paint coming into the digital world, right. that's where these younger artists don't understand. They think magically they get Photoshop and now they're going to be able to do all these wonderful things. That's, that's it, the myth, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, there, there's so many people that, that, you know, they, they don't really understand what digital art is to, to me. Digital art is really just, it's just another medium and it's just a big fancy pencil. It's still, you still have to input the, the, the information. And so, um, you know, there's nothing there that's drawing for me. I'm drawing. It's just, I'm drawing with pixels and light rather than, you know, pigment. And, uh, and it, so it, you know, it, it's, that's the, and that's what I want to show today. Cause I know we, we've got several people that might not, you know, be as familiar with digital art and painting and that whole world. And I wanted to show how similar it really is because I had, you know, in my early days, I had the same prejudice. I really didn't know what it was. And it wasn't until about 10 years into my career, 15 years into my career, really, that I decided to make that transition and try to do more digital art. And, and that was because at Disney, I had finished up with Brother Bear and I still hadn't done any digital art during that period. And I was, I was, I was going to uh, direct another film and the film we were developing was going to be a computer animated film, a digital film. Everything else we had done, you know, Brother Bear on back through Lion King and Beauty and the Beast, those are still hand drawn. We drew every frame. You know, <laughs> that's another thing that people are amazed at. They think that we use computers to make those. No, we we drew every single frame, 24 frames per second. So that's 24 drawings per for every second that goes by. It's a very labor intensive, lots of drawings. But uh, anyway, so this next film, I was going to be doing uh, a CG film and I realized, you know what, I've got to if I'm going to be doing development work, visual development, which is what I was doing for the film, I need to know how to draw and paint and create digitally. And so um, that's what I did I, starting about 15, 16 years ago. And once I understood the software and got over the fear of it, I realized, oh, my gosh, this is it's just like drawing and painting on, on an easel. I'm just painting with with pixels instead. And then and well, could you could you show our people? A little bit about what you're talking about. Sure. The actual thing here. Yeah, let's show let's show the screen. I want to show you guys the screen what I work on. I'm gonna jump over to Photoshop. Okay. So 
I am going to, you can bring that over. So I've just created a document here. And once again, this is for folks that um, might not be familiar with this kind of work. They're seeing you this point of view right now. Yeah. So you can see I've got this big screen right here. And I've got a document right here, just like a canvas. The cool thing about this is I can blow it up and I can zoom out. So, it, you know, I can see it at any scale. And I can grab pigment color over here. And I can grab a brush over here, any kind of brush that I want. And I'd create my own brushes to give myself more natural looking line work. But once again, so I'm working in Photoshop, but I'm drawing just like I would on a piece of paper. So you can see, you know, the computer's not doing it for me. I'm, I'm drawing. And that's what's really great about this. Now, this is probably overkill for what a lot of people want to do, but there's there's other hardware, you know, pieces of hardware that you can use that do the same thing as this that aren't quite as uh, over the top and dramatic as something like this. But here's a little Disney character. But um, this is what's... This is what I why I loved and and transitioned so easily into the digital world was because of this equipment. I was um uh I was able to transition because it's it's literally is like drawing on a piece of paper. So I took my traditional thinking, the way I draw, the way that I paint, and I just applied it to the software and boom, I was, you know, within less than a day I was up, you know, up and running, doing drawings and paintings, you know, digitally. And, well, and I, I spent, of, go ahead. What a lot of art, what a lot of artists that I talk to, and I'm talking to them about an iPad, but it, right. and yours is like a big super iPad. Exactly. And uh, yeah. what, um, what they don't understand is that in traditional ways, we draw on a piece of paper. Then we got to think about if we want to add color to it, we got to go mix the color or change Right. A different brush in what you're doing, and you are so fluid in it now that it's just magical to watch it happen. Right. Well, one of the huge advantages of working digitally like this that you don't have traditionally is being able to work in layers that you can separate. And so I just did a drawing layer right here that I was able to actually knock the opacity back on, but I can create another layer and go under that drawing that I just created. And if I want to add some color to it, under the drawing, I can just add color to it. And, you know, so this is where you have an advantage over traditional work. Once again, I'm still painting just like I would, you know, traditionally, there's nothing's doing it for me, but I have some advantages because of the, of the medium. And really every medium has, has different advantages and disadvantages. You know, oil has advantages and disadvantages, watercolor, acrylic, and we just adapt to them. And it's the same with digital work. Um, you know, it has its advantages and disadvantages. And so it's just, you know, you decide what you want to do and you and you roll with it. Um, uh, I've got, um, I was actually thinking I could uh, do something a little more in the realm of, you know, wildlife art for a demo for this, uh, for this class. I thought it'd be kind of fun. And uh, I can go ahead and start that and we can continue talking if you want, David. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Actually, I'll just demo. I'm going to I'm going to dump these images. The first thing that I usually do is I'll start with a toned canvas. I like and this and once again I want to reiterate. I start with a toned canvas when I when I work uh, in oil. You know, I tone, I, I yeah. tone my canvas. I get rid of that white, and so I do the same thing when I'm working digitally. And um, I'm going to show you really quick. I've got this in. Well, this is one uh, we were talking earlier. David and I about like when I get an idea, what do I, you know, for an image, what do I do? Um, a lot of times I'll sit down and I'll sketch in my sketchbook. I've got a whole pile of traditional art next to me and, and I have literally piles of, of sketchbooks. So I still work a lot digitally, 
I mean, uh, traditionally, but I'll also sit down. I was watching a documentary the other night on, on chimpanzees and there was a section where they, they were hunting colobus monkeys and it was just really brutal and, and made an impact on me. And there is a scene where they were looking up into the trees and it stuck in my brain. So I had to run in here and just sketch really quick. And so that's one of the things that digital work enables you to do is just get an idea out really quickly. And so I had this, this idea for a painting and, uh, and threw it down really fast. And, and the beauty of, of being able to do something like that is I can save that image and I can print it out. I can, or I can, you know, put it on another screen and I can use that as a comp for, or a thumbnail for a traditional painting. I do that all the time. So I'll work out all my problems digitally and then go and, and do my oil painting or my watercolor hey, or whatever. One thing I want to let people know, because we've got some people from our, uh, we're simulcasting today. We're simulcasting for our usual viewers. This is uh, Nick. I work with Aaron. Yep. Uh, we're simulcasting today on our normal channels, but we're also going out on the Susan Caffeine Black Foundation channels. Uh, we are now live on their Facebook, so we got that working, and we're out on their YouTube as well. So we're going to kind of address comments from both, uh, but I want to let our audience know who might not be as familiar with what we're doing today, uh, that we're going to be, Aaron is going to be out in September uh, doing a live workshop, and there's a slide up for it now. Uh, for You can check out the skbworkshop.com uh, URL, and uh, that's going to be in September out in Wyoming, yeah. a live in-person workshop. Uh, we're really hoping a lot of, uh, you know, people, probably people based in the States can join us. But um, anywhere in the world, it's open to. And there is also going to be a Zoom uh, for that as well. Is that correct, David? Yeah, there will be. We will Zoom some of that. I don't know how much, but we'll figure that out. We've, we've been doing it uh, dramatically, uh, all Zoom, or mostly Zoom. But now this year, we're going back to our more traditional workshop, which is, uh, you know, it will be live. Uh, live people that... Uh, not so much Zoom as, as we've done before. So the fact is that uh, live workshops are coming back big where people are, are venturing out and traveling and um, people getting a chance. I can hear you. Those of you who have worked with, with uh, Aaron on screen here from wherever you are, uh, it's an opportunity to actually work with him. In a, in a classroom and um, that's really special yeah absolutely i mean hell you're going all the way to europe and you're going all over europe doing just that right yeah yeah we, we've got i don't know how many stops we're doing in europe but we're going to be there for a month and uh we'll be in the ne netherlands uh belgium uh austria and, and germany and we're stopping in conferences and private demos, all kinds of stuff. We're doing animal drawing, teaching animation. I'm teaching character design. We're teaching all kinds of stuff. So yeah, it's going to be a blast. So um, so real quick, let me, I, before we go into the drawing, actually, I thought it might be, for those of you that aren't familiar with my work and aren't familiar with, you know, the digital side of things, I wanted to take you through a little bit of a gal of my gallery that I have on my website and just show you, um, some of the traditional and some of the, the digital work that I have. Um, hopefully these, you can see these okay because they're not blown up full screen. But um, let me see here. Try to do it with an arrow. There we go. So this is a digital piece. And and like I said, sometimes you just get, I get inspiration from something and I'll just run off and draw it and paint it. I was watching a, a National Geographic documentary. I think it was National or, or Big Cats or something and saw, you know, this threat, this, battle between a lion and, and crocs in the Mara River. And I thought, oh, I want to go and paint that. So that's what I did here. And I did it digitally. But then, you know, I also work in charcoal. This is a giant, like three feet by four foot, you know, charcoal drawing. And, uh, you know, I, I do stuff like that. Here's another charcoal drawing, um, digital. So it's, it's, this is digital. These are all, you know, once again, one of the beauties I love about working digitally is the ability to get an idea out quickly. And look at this, you know, there's a digital painting. That's a digital painting. 
and that's a digital painting. It looks, this one looks like it's a traditional drawing, but it's, it's done digitally. I can, you know, you can, depending on the surface and the brushes you use, you can make them look any way you want. And, uh, but here's a watercolor. This is a ballpoint pen and watercolor, uh, that I did, you know, for, you know, sitting down one evening, uh, another same thing, watercolor and ballpoint pen. Uh, but then here's a, a, a digital drawing. That's the beauty of that. You can really, you know, this is a digital painting as well, but I wanted it to look like an oil painting. Um, this one I wanted to look like a pastel. So lots and lots of uh, possibilities. And well, and people don't, the, the idea of uh, learning how to um, do this and have it look like oil or watercolor or whatever. That's a, an extra added cool thing. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. It's a lot of fun. And I, one of the, one of the things I enjoy doing on the digital side of things is creating brushes that give me the effect that I'm looking for. Um, so that's, that's a lot of fun. Now, you know, would I, would I take my digital work and print it out huge and frame it? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I still, I still love, you know, a nice big oil painting framed in my living room. But the fact that, you know, I can do digital illustration for books, for magazines, for comps, for my, for my large traditional paintings, for entertainment to design environments and characters for movies, that's where it really kicks in. And I just, I love it. It's a, it's, as an artist, you know, being able to sit down and get a full blown painting out, an image out, out of my system in three hours, as opposed to two weeks, you know, that's, that's great. You know, this is an oil painting, but I, I did it digitally first and then I painted it in oil. So another oil. Well, one of the, thing, one of the things that impressed me was, um, another your oil. large charcoals, uh, that you do that, uh, you're going to be doing some of that out in Wyoming. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm definitely going to be doing that. I love I love that ability to do that because uh, that's an art all unto itself. And uh, these are all all of these that I just went through were all traditional oil. Or this one's a whoop. That, that's a watercolor. Uh, this is oil, oil. You know, oil painting. I think if you hit Command and scroll on your mouse, you can zoom in. Oh, okay. If you want. To. Well, I'm going to jump back to, I just wanted to, show, I just wanted people to see, um, uh, that, you know, we're, I'm doing a lot of traditional work as well. And it, and, you know, it just, it, it applies. The, with, the one thing I've noticed is that, um, once I started working digitally and really got into it, it really affected my traditional work. It freed me up because I wasn't, a, I wasn't afraid to, when I was working digitally, I wasn't afraid to you know, mess up a canvas or, a, or a, an expensive piece of 300 pound arches paper. Right. And, uh, and I just, it just made me more free and more confident. And, and so it, my, my traditional work ended up getting a lot more life in it. And then, you know, just the way that I work traditionally, it really affects my digital work and makes it look more traditional and painterly. So it's kind of cool. Uh, but I'm going to jump over uh, back to my, we're going to jump back over to Photoshop. And um, here we are. And those of you that are familiar with Photoshop, Photoshop is the big dog in, as far as computer imaging goes. But what Aaron does with it is a Photoshop that I work in Photoshop, but I've never done anything even close to what he does. With, he's a magician with Photoshop. <laughs> Well, one of the cool things that you, that I can that anyone can do, and I and I use it very heavily when I'm when I'm doing development work for uh, film, uh, environmental design or character design, is I'll do a lot of mixtures between my painting and photography. It's called photo bashing, and um, uh, let me see if I can find one in here because I know I've got some. It's basically you know taking photographic textures and mixing them in with my digital painting and creating something that feels real, but is not. Uh, let me actually- What do you call it? photo bashing? It's called photo bashing. You're bashing the photo right into your painting. <laughs> so that's, that's basically where it came from. Um, but I'll show you, uh, 
like this, for example. This squirrel. How do I make it? How do I? Command while you zoom. Just command and and uh, scroll. Okay, command. Shoot. Oh, it's not gonna no. Okay. Well, anyway, the the textures on this squirrel, I drew the squirrel and painted it traditionally, but then I went in and grabbed fur textures, photographic fur textures, and laid them over the top of it. I was able to kind of cut and paste, and you end up with the, this character that feels like it's, you know, right out of a, a CG film. That's the idea. Um, you know, when I'm doing these, I want them to, uh, uh, let's see, where's some of my... I guess I don't have any, we don't have any of the uh, King of the Elves in here. There should be the, oh, here we the, go. The Steve Jobs one yeah. there for sure. Right now. Like this one here, you know, this is a photograph of, of a lily pond and I painted in this little frog character, frog fish character. And uh, let's see, let's see where else we got. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to drag it down too quick, too much. Oh, I'm on my, uh, I'm in the animal drawing gallery. Sorry, hold on. Concept art. That's the other gallery. But um, yeah, so it just it provides uh, this one here. Actually, where is it? Yeah, the the elf one. This I one. know it's on. Oh, this one's good. Uh, interesting. So this one, it's all you know, moss textures and uh, skin textures and all kinds of stuff to make this feel like it's a frame from a movie. So that's that's a lot of fun. Yeah, the the old one's not in there. I don't see it. It's there somewhere. What's, ama what's amazing is that you not only do you have the is. ability to middle. draw and stuff like that and paint and use the computer, but uh, what always amazes me is that you go back and forth between humorous images that have that humorous side and humorous touch to more naturalistic. And it's just a fluid transfer of of focus, and I mean this is beautiful. This this nymphette or whatever. Oh, thanks. And it's got and all these textures and well, that's colors I, and yeah. I think that I think that comes from the Disney side, just having worked in you know making cartoons and and whatnot for so long. So I'm just going to show you really quick that you know the process. My process. I'm going to turn the hey, fan on. Hey, Aaron, here. hold hold on a second, Aaron. Can you hold your stylus up and show them what you're drawing with? We go full screen on that. Or uh, which way? Which one am I looking? Show at? the tip of the stylus. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's just a. It's it looks like a, a ballpoint pen. That's what it looks like. There you go. Yeah, here it goes. It's a stylus. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a stylus. Looks like a ballpoint pen. Um, is it pressure sensitive? Yep, yeah, pressure sensitive. So that's the other cool thing. So if I if I draw lightly, it goes on lightly. If I draw hard, it goes on hard. And then I turn my turn my stylus over, and it's got an eraser on the end. So I'm literally drawing as if I'm drawing with a pencil. This might cause a a delay, but I think if you share your and you jump over to Zoom and share your desktop with. Uh, David, you'll be able to see what you're doing as well, possibly. Do what now? If it's Zoom, if you go share your desktop, then David will be able to see your oh. desktop as well. Okay. Let me do that. Let's go to Zoom and then share and share. There we go. Like that. Yep. You should be able to jump back over to Photoshop. There so, we go. Cool. So. I'm, uh, I'm just going to run through this real quick. Now, what, I want to show you this piece of uh, reference. I chose this purposely. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful photo. It's a, this is a shot my son took when we were in Africa uh, back in October. Um, but it's all flat light. It's all, you know, there's, there's no real shadows here. It's all ambient light. And I wanted to show you that, you know, you can use reference like this if you like a pose or you like an expression or whatever, but then you can, uh, and this is what I do digitally. I can sit down and figure out my lighting and, and, uh, and not change poses as, as well, but you can figure out your lighting and then use that as your comp for your painting if you want to do that later. But let me, uh, so keep that in mind. And then uh, as we get further down the, the road here and getting this done, 
uh, and I'm going to do it fairly quick and loose today. Uh, you'll see that it you you've got to you know you don't have to be a slave to your reference, and that's something I'm always pushing with students as well. Is you know everyone feels like oh I got you know this is what my reference looks like, so I got to make it look like my reference. No, you don't. You're the master of your artistic world, and so you can do anything you want. Oh, thanks. Nick's taking care of me here. So I'll just go through very quickly. And because it's in layers, I can do as many refinement layers as I want. That's actually the, the magic key on working this way that artists don't have when they're working with a sketchbook is Photoshop layers is just amazing in the way you can do this and the way you develop some of these images you have of how many layers? Dozens? Some of them, yeah. I mean, some of them, especially the, the development, the visual development Im images that I'm doing for film and environmental design and that sort of thing. Some of them ha might have 50 or 60 layers to them. Here's one of the fun things you can do for those of you that aren't familiar. If you want to draw, and here I'm, you know, I don't want this to be perfectly symmetrical, so I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm drawing it freehand, but if I wanted it to be symmetrical, I could actually go, okay, I'm going to come down here. Whoops, let me move this down here and then i'm gonna go ooh, look at this <laughs> so you can draw and it gives you all kinds of options to do to do that with that, that could be great for stuff like jewelry or patterns or exactly yeah you draw you just draw one side and it replicates it exactly cool so that is an example of the digital part of it doing it for you <laughs> And you see the way you're working here um, with this critter is that this all looks very traditional. Exactly. If, if well, this you were working on a sketch pad with a this with is a pencil. This is actually a brush that I created because uh, I wanted something that felt and looked like you know a soft maybe six B pencil. And uh, and so I spent some time. A few days kind of figuring it out and, and ended up with with this brush which is uh something that uh someone just kind of asked a related question one uh, for those that don't know obviously that haven't worked digitally that's one of the cool things about photoshop is you can create you're not just at the mercy of the brushes that are built in by default you can use you can create your own brushes people sell brushes for different textures and techniques and all kinds of stuff to give you different looks and feels um also, uh, someone had a question, Aaron, and I think this would be relevant to both audiences. How often, do you, how often do you find that you need to change the nibs on your stylus? Uh, for those who don't know, the nib is the actual tip of the stylus, and, and that's actually a replaceable part. Yeah, it is a replaceable part. And it's interesting because um, Wacom, who's the company that makes the Cintiqs here, um, and check them out. Just uh, It's Wacom.com, W-A-C-O-M.com. Um, they uh they recently with this model that i have now uh they've added a slight grit texture to the screen so it actually feels like you're working on a piece of paper um they've been very very uh artist conscious in, in their development that's so, amazing yeah and so you know back in the day i would use before they had that and the screen was really slick I would put this kind of felt tip, um, tip nib inside my stylus, and it would feel more like a, you know drawing on a piece of paper. Now so that you get, a, you get a bit of a drag, yeah, you do exactly. It's a, it's like a slight resistance, and now, um, now that they've got the 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 screen texture, um, I just use their regular plastic nibs now, and I have the same effect. Before I was having to change out the nibs about once a month. I've had this this Cintiq now for 
I think two years. Yeah. I've never changed the nib. Yeah. I've had the same nib for two years. Well, and the nibs aren't expensive you no. know, when you go to change it. If you, if you, some people still like to use the felt because they prefer the feel, feel of it. You know, again, it's, it's sort of like having a different brush in your toolbox, you know, or. Exactly. And this is the other thing too. Look at this. I can, by hitting this button up here, up in the top, I can make my, uh, my, I can, first of all, I can increase the size of my brush or shrink it, but I'm going to increase the size and I can make it do a big stroke like that, or I push, push that button and then it's pressure sensitive to, you know, if I, if I touch lightly, it gives me a skinny line. If I press hard, it gives me a harder line. And then you can erase it. Exactly. I remember, um, I don't know how many of you know John Banovich, but I, I gave a, a lecture a few years ago to the Society of Animal Artists, and John Banovich was there, and he hadn't really done any digital art before, and I basically went through the same stuff then that I'm talking about now, and he, and he just saw all the possibilities, and all of a sudden his brain just started racing. And uh, he stood up and he goes, I feel like a, a fish that's leapt out of the water and is breathing air for the first time. <laughs> that's funny. I remember that. Yeah. So, so here I've got this very rough sketch. So now what I can do is knock the opacity back, create a new layer on top, and now I've got this underdrawing, and I can go in, this is how I usually do it, and just start to refine my drawing. <clears throat> and as I'm doing this, feel free to to type in and ask questions because that you know that's what we we usually do. Every Friday I do a live stream. So for those of you that are just tuning in for the first time, if you're interested in in more of these, we do it every Friday. Although over the next few weeks we might it might be spotty because we're going to be in Europe. But when we're home, we we do them every Friday. And you really should. Uh... Check his uh, Facebook and um, YouTube channels out uh, to keep you up and in, informed, especially on Facebook. He lets you know ahead of time what's coming up and when it's coming, and uh, you can stay connected that way. And um, and our website I too, would, if you're interested in any, you know, just seeing what we do, go to it's creatureartteacher.com. Well, that's the best. Uh, your website is fantastic. Thanks. So I'm just going through and and just shoring things up. Now I I draw very quickly and and I try to be very direct. I think that's just from years of drawing animation drawing after animation drawing. It just it gives you the same experience absolutely uh, that you have traditionally as an artist is working on their own sketchbook in their studio and they see an image that they're working on as it gradually appears. It's just that here um, it gradually appears very quickly and uh, it gives you the creative ability to be more creative yourself and try things out. You know, in, in, uh, in our, you know, we always used to say that, or we still say, you know, that, you know, the, the being able to draw, that's our, for what I was doing in 2D animation, that, that was our, our visual language. That's our, it, that's our language, I should say. You know, we, we, we communicate with, through images. And so the better and quicker we could sketch and draw, the faster we could get our ideas out. And so that, you know, getting into this was really such a huge breakthrough for us because 
you could lay down and get ideas out so quickly and sketch on paper as well. I mean, when we're sitting in a, a story meeting or whatever, we, you know, the, the, the drawing on paper is never going to go away. But being able to sit down and say, hey, I've got an idea for this environment or I've got an idea for how we can light this, you know, and, and, and run in my office really quick and, you know, and in less than an hour, I can have a quick sketch of, you know, a rough environment with, you know, the way I want to, I want to light it, you know, with, throw down an idea. Are there any plugins required or anything for your, uh, for this to work with Photoshop? No. Oh, it just works right out of the gate. That right out of the gate. That was a question from the Choosing Kathleen Black Facebook page. Now, the thing with the thing with Photoshop is that you don't buy the software, you subscribe to it. So, yeah. um, and some people don't like that, but I just think it's fantastic because it's always updating. And you don't have to buy the their entire suite. You can get just Photoshop and I think Lightroom or something. And I think it's 10 bucks, a month. 10 bucks or 15 bucks a month. And if you're a teacher or a student, they've got great teacher and student discounts. And I know that, I don't know if they still make it anymore, but for many years they made a, a lighter version called Photoshop Elements. I think they still make that, and that might be an a la carte purchase, but I, I'm not 100% sure on Yeah. Photoshop Elements. Yeah. Yes, it's sort of a lighter version. How many hours a day do you work every day, and how many hours are split uh, between drawing and managing your time? I... I... When I'm working, I'm I'll, I do a full eight hours, and I try to get I try to get in front of my computer by eight eight. Sometimes I'm there by six thirty in the morning. Sometimes I'm there at ten o'clock in the morning, and I just and I work until, you know, if I'm really into it, I'll work in, until midnight. If I'm you know just kind of putting in the time, then I'll I'll work until dinner time, and then I'm done. I treat it like a regular job, you know, as if I'm going into the office, and uh, um. You know, right now I'm doing my, uh, I'm working on my own short film, Nick and I. And so that I'm super passionate about and really having a great time. So I, I'm on it as often as I can. Uh, this is from Alexandra on, the, on their YouTube channel. And she says, I'm a traditional painter. At what stage do you figure out your lighting and your focal points in your painting? Thanks. Well, that's a, that's a great that's a, a great question because I do it differently digitally than I do traditionally. And, and I, the working digitally, it, it, uh, offers you some advantages. You know, when you're drawing, uh, and painting traditionally, you have to think about light shadow, local color, all that kind of stuff, Te light, uh, color temperature. You have to think about all of that pretty much all at once as you're, as you're working. Now you can build up layers and you can, you know, in oil and acrylic and, 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 work that way um obviously but photoshop and working digitally offer some advantages that i can't really get traditionally and so what i do is i lay in my local color meaning for those of you that don't know local color is the color of an object when it's not lit it's just the color of an object like a green shirt or a red apple and um so i'll just lay that in and then i can completely separate paint my shadows in i can paint my highlights in and then i can go in over the top of that which you could in, in traditional media and paint in you know uh, uh uh more you know whether cool temperature you might need or or warm temperature or, or whatever you might need you can you can do that as well but the big hey, like hey, i said the big thing is i you know being able to lay in my local color and then find the shadows hey aaron uh I don't know if you would have it available or if it's too hard to find, but I remember seeing uh, something you did on this subject that had to do with lighting a, a, a lion. I think it was a male lion yep. lying on the grass, and you then you lit it three different ways. Yes, and that's that's actually from my it. yeah, that's from my course on uh, on light. You know, because I have a certain way that I approach painting light. And um, I did that as a demo. I took the same basic uh, local color painting drawing, and uh, and and lit it. Which that ways. not to plug our stuff, but uh, that course is we're having a really big sale over on our website, and that course is only ten dollars right now. So, uh, so there you go. <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I've changed the the parameters. Um, so now I've taken the pressure sensitivity sensitivity off 
and um, I've chosen kind of this base color. I picked a, I've created a layer underneath both my drawing layers, and I'm just painting in almost like it's with a, you know, a roller or whatever, and just painting in the silhouette. And of uh, man, it's going a little bit slow. I think because of uh, it's dry, it's zoom dry. might be yeah. zoom sharing the screen. Yeah, because we're we're I'm working. Uh, I'm sharing the screen. You can see how my drawing is kind of lagging. It's it's going slow. You could stop sharing. Well, that's and while, right. while you while you watch him do this, I want you to think about how you would do it traditionally. How what would you have to do to do what he's doing here? So now look at this. Actually, I'm going to turn. Let me turn this off. I just turned off the background. I can see where there's any holes. I'm going to fill in these holes really quick. Oh, that's right. Yeah, let me. Sh I'm going to shrink this up a little bit. This is the other thing, the image size. So this is an 18, 18 by 24 inches at 300 DPI, which is a pretty big image and very detailed. You could blow this up to the size of a two-story building and it would hold together. I'm going to drop it in half. So it, it won't, uh, there's not as many, as much, not as much information to worry about. So I can, it won't lag as much. So what I've done here, so what I want you to see here is I've, I've created this, this image. And what I can do now is I can lock it. I can lock the pixels I just painted. I can lock, and what it does is it locks that silhouette. And it only will allow, if, when I do that, I can get really free with it and it, I won't go outside the silhouette. And what I mean by that is I can go in and say, okay, I want a little bit warmer, darker color here. I'm going to come up here and I'm just going to start laying in. And once again, I'm still working in uh, local color and I'll just start laying in kind of some of the, the, the variances in the fur. But I don't have to worry. I can go, draw right to the edge and notice it doesn't allow me to go out off the edge. So I can get really free with it and not have to, uh, oh man, I got to race this back or whatever. I can, I can just draw as crazy as I want and it won't go off the edge. I, I, I just spent my time, you know, creating that silhouette. And so doing this, I'm going to just like a lion has, I'm going to create variations of color, of temperature, of all of that, all in the local color. Once again, I want to emphasize this is local color. I'm not painting any shadow or light yet. I'm just trying to get the color of the, of the actual fur. Of the cat. I'm going to go really fast. So you'll see me jump back and forth between the uh, the color picker, which is what I'm working with here, and the uh, and my painting. You can see it allows it me to be, be... It might be interesting, Aaron, to show them that color picker over there. Yeah. What? How you're going back and forth to it? Yeah, so here's the color picker. This is there's a little there's a little swatch right over here on the left, and all I have to do is click on that, and it gives me the color picker. And I, there's a whole rainbow up and down right here that I can choose from. And right now I'm in the earth tones, and then within that I can go more pure in the hue or or or, or tone down, and then I can go light and dark. So I, I pick an area within that square. And right now I want to go a little lighter. And I'm just, this is, it, it, it looks like a, kind of like a, a pastel, this brush that I've created. Kind of this pastel feel. And then I actually call it a pastel, a pastel brush. So I'm going to treat this really loose. Hey, if I wanted to do this with you, I don't have those brushes. Well. What the hell do I do? 
I've, I'm not going to make my own brush. I don't know how to do that. I've, I have them available on my website. Plus, I um, on that digital, on my the course where I teach digital painting, I have a whole section in the course where I teach you how to make your own brushes, too. Um, but this brush that I'm actually using, and I use this brush, I would lit, literally about 90 to 80% of the time I use this brush. And uh, it's available, you know, on my website. You can just, you don't have to pay for it. You can just download it. You just got to sign up for my newsletter. Yeah, you can get it for free for the, <laughs> in the newsletter. Or if you want to buy the entire set, it's only a dollar. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. Because of our sale. Yeah, it's a set of like 20 brushes and it's only a buck. Actually, um, you should maybe, not not to plug the website, but just to show them the sorts of things you might use brushes for, maybe show some of our brush packs so they get an idea of why you would use a different brush in a different situation. I know you're drawing a line now, so I don't want to... Well, this is, I, I've got a whole bunch of traditional brushes for traditional painting like this, but also for for more, you know, visual development type work for, for more of the entertainment industry and, and that sort of thing. I've got different brushes that that literally are meant to serve different purposes like let me just turn these off really quick i've got um hair brushes that literally just paint hair boom look at that we got it but you of... made you made this brush yes i made these yeah <laughs> so that paints fur but not just not, not just that fur i've got you know different textures of fur and hair. So I've got a whole brush set for that. I've also got foliage brushes so you can make plants. Boom. Or you can make pine trees. Look at that. And if I, now this is an instance of, oh, hey, the computer just did it for you. <laughs> but for somebody that, one of the things I, I like to do in Photoshop is for somebody that might not be able to draw as well, but want to have the, the joy of drawing. I give them a little advantage with, the, with, the, with these brushes. Like here, here's a, you know, an old pine tree. What advice would you give someone just starting out with digital painting? Um, really don't be afraid of it. Get in there and attack it and try different things. Um, but also get some lessons, you know, when you're, that's whatever software you might be using, it can be really intimidating. And, uh, and so get some lessons first and, um, uh, and it'll at least to, to open up the, just getting you started. It's almost like, you know, when you open up a, um, something you've just uh like an, a new electronic and it's the the quick start guide to get it to get rolling on it i recommend doing that for for you know for your digital stuff and then once you get going you'll you'll start just discovering ways of doing things on your own i mean so much of what i'm showing you today is just a result of discoveries that i've made um in the way i do it you know just adapting the the software to my needs that's one of the beauties of of Photoshop is that it's so robust, it allows you to work in a huge number of you know ways. Now, you when know, you're you... out, um, when you're out in Wyoming in September, you're going to be doing both digital and traditional demos, right? Yes, yeah. So I'm going to be working traditional as well. And for those uh, that might just be joining us for whatever reason, uh, we are actually Aaron's going to be out in. Wyoming in September doing a live in-person multi-day workshop and uh, you can go to skbworkshop.com I've got the URL up on the screen now and uh, learn more about that because that's a that's a limited number of spots available so the sooner you sign up uh, the better but uh, for those of you that have wanted to work with Aaron and want to learn both digital and traditional drawing and uh, directly in a hands-on environment that definitely might be worth checking out Uh, speaking of which, just to give people an idea of your traditional work, let's go to this Oh, the giant watercolor. Yeah, that's the other thing too. I want to I want to reiterate that I still work a lot traditionally. Let's see. Let's 
Here, I'll hold on to it. The sound of a big, thick piece of watercolor paper. <laughs> what is that? The oh, there it is. So this is a watercolor. I actually did this as a demo. This giant. You can see how big this is. This giant leopard did this. Uh, this is from uh, once again reference that we shot in Africa, but uh, we recorded the whole thing. Um, but I've done I've done some of this very leopard. I've done a ton of digital paintings of this leopard. I've done charcoal drawings. I've done graphite drawings. I've done watercolor, all kinds of stuff. So, and you um, fi you find that the two inform each other, right? They really do. Yeah. So I can make I can spend as whoops, I can spend as much time on these digital drawings. This is going to be more of a sketch, but I can spend as much time on this as we want. Um, you know, refining it, refining it, refining it. I tend to go. I like a more painterly. Uh, you know, in my younger days, I I was more of a detailed painter, but I like I like a lot more painterly work now, and so I try to bring that into my digital work as well. So I tend to make my leave my digital paintings a little more painterly. But as you can see, it's all it's as if I'm drawing with with pastel. It's 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 uh it's not being painted by the computer. <laughs> is each one of these colors that you're putting on is it on a separate layer? No, these are all on the same layer. So what I've done, here's that, that's the layer right there. So I, I created that first, um, that first basic silhouette, that, that ochre looking silhouette of the cat's fur. And then I locked it. And so now I'm just working within that silhouette. It doesn't allow me to, to draw outside of it so I can keep it somewhat neat. Um, but, uh, But it, yeah, it's all on the same layer. Now I could, you know, if I if I'm unsure of of a of a, a decision like a, a color I might want to use or a, a compositional element, I'll create a new layer for it, try it out, and if I like it, I'll I'll work it in. If I don't like it, I can just delete that layer and move on. So that's what another advantage of working digitally. And uh, this is from the. Uh the SKB Facebook page, someone wants to do, can I do this on an iPad, like go to the zoo and paint with an iPad? What software would you recommend? Maybe Procreate? Procreate, absolutely. And yes, you can, because uh, when we were in Africa just recently, I brought all my traditional gear with me, um, but I also brought my iPad. And um, we've got footage of me sitting in the Land Rover, you know, sketching cheetahs next to the Land Rover on my iPad. So I'm just getting down to a little bit of detail right now. The other thing about this, and maybe you brought this up, but uh, here's this lioness, and you've developed her so far this way, but you could sit there and let's say that you're having lunch and you look at it and you go, God, I wonder what that would look like at nighttime. Exactly. And that's, that's actually what I'm going to show you next. You can do exactly that. It's really cool in that sense. And so the other thing too, is I can turn off the, that initial sketch layer. I can knock this layer back if I want and what that, or just turn it off. And you can see how much the drawing holds it together. Um, but a lot of times uh, I'll leave the drawing. I'll probably leave the drawing layer in here, um, but I'll work the painting until the drawing's gone. Cause I'll work right over the top, but we've got, we've got a basic, uh, a nice basic foundation now and so now uh what i'm going to do i'm first i'm going to go into the background and i'm going to grab some nice uh kind of dark greens i've got a big pastel brush here that i like to use that's nice and textured and um i'm going to come in here look at this nice texture oh it goes on i love how this goes on and i'm just going to go in and I want the background to be kind of soft and and uh, just uh, suggested. I'm not. 
I don't want to say it's out of focus. I, I guess it's going to be out of focus, but I don't want it to be just blurry. I'm just want to go in and just going to go in with a few different colors. I can jump up and down in the color, my color picker. And just start, you know, just vary it up. If I want to go, oh, let me you know, as we get to closer to the top, maybe it gets a little hotter because we're getting more towards sunlit stuff in the background. So I'll go, okay, let's try that. Now, as we go down lower, maybe it gets a little cooler and a little more, not as pure in color. Down lower. Because you got that animal on a separate layer, yeah. you don't have to worry about the edge. Exactly. I'm drawing behind. That's a good point. I forgot to point that out because I'm just used to it. Um, I'm, I'm painting on the, on the actually, I'm painting on the background layer. I shouldn't be doing that. Um, I always try to keep my background free, but. Uh, but anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm just painting on a layer that's under the drawing layer or under the, the character layer, I should say, or the, the subject layer. So there's, you know, kind of roughed in, maybe there's some little spots of dappled lighting in the background. This is all this is all stuff you could do with a with chalk or pastel because that's basically how this is going on. So the thing I wanted to show you now, I just wanted to get a background in there um, because now you can create different painting properties. Now this is where the, the true advantage of working digitally comes in because I can create. I'm going to create a clipping mask. Now, what does that mean? Well, I've just highlighted my painting layer of the character. I'm going to create a layer on top of that. And then I highlight it and go clipping mask. And now what that enables, I, I can create, I can draw, do layers over the top of this. And just like when I locked the, the initial layer, it won't allow me to draw outside the silhouette of what I've created. But then on top of that, I can change the property of the the paint that I'm putting down. So rather than just going on like regular pigment, like I've been doing, I can come up and where it says normal right here, I can come in here and there's all different types of properties that I can give to that layer. So I'm going to click on multiply. And what that does is it literally takes the paint, the color that I'm using, and it multiplies it with the color that's already underneath it. And what that does is it creates a really cool shadow effect. And that's how I create my initial shadows. So you, if you watch, if I draw across the face of this, see how it multiplies with the layers underneath and it makes it, it's translucent. And so this, this is, this is a nice digital cheat that you can't get. And this is why I, uh, that you can't get traditionally. And this is why I'll do my comps uh, digitally because it's so much quicker um, to, to figure out your light and dark patterns. And here I want kind of a dramatic, I'm thinking about the light kind, kind of uh, coming from the right, but if she's standing in a thicket, let's say, you know, maybe some of that, if the light, her, the right side of her is lit up, but she's, she's standing in a shadow area. I mean, maybe darken this a little bit and I can control the uh, the temperature as well but I want to I want to keep the temperature warm on this because um, because it multiplies if I go cool it tends to gray out the color wait when you get a second I got two questions from the SKB YouTube sure I don't want to step no, go ahead talk uh, it's related uh, uh, does your lighting course cover traditional paintings uh, in other words, since I'm not a digital painter, would it be helpful for me as a traditional painter? The thinking will. I do. I do uh, a fair amount of it digitally, only because it it it, I, it works faster for me. But all the logic is the same. The right? logic is all the same. Yeah, 
And then uh, this is a question. Is Adobe Illustrator similar to what you're doing now? No. Adobe Illustrator, even though it sounds like it should be because it says Illustrator, uh, it's, a, it's different. Um, most people do their illustrations uh, with, uh, as far as Adobe products go with Photoshop. Yeah, uh, it's, it's confusing nomenclature, but Adobe Illustrator should be called like Adobe Logos. Because that's, I mean, it's really more about graphic design and yeah. logos. You got to remember it's, these, it's, these, it's these graphics program. Yeah, these applications came out before, like Photoshop really was for photos back in the day. Yep. Um, but it, it turned into being a really great uh, painting tool, they discovered. So look at this, you know, just by painting in, you know, cast shadows and, and direct light, I can create, you know, some pretty dramatic lighting. I've got, you know, this shadow going across the side of the head. Um, I can do this type of thing here. This might be a question for both of you, since you're both uh, experienced artists. Uh, Hi, I'm a professional artist that's been drawing all my life, but I've recently found that my wrists and shoulders and even my fingers hurt when I draw. Do you have any advice for sustainability? I, for me, I, um, I don't have that issue. And I tend to, I, I don't, I don't grip really hard and I don't use my wrist as much. I draw from the shoulder. It's one of the reasons why I keep my Cintiq up high like this. Um, and so I've never really had any issues with it. So I would suggest maybe doing something like that. Draw from your shoulder, not draw your from, wrist. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything different to say, David. No, I, I definitely train people to draw with their arm, not their wrist and their fingers. And it's much better. So look at this. Look at this kind of dramatic lighting and shadow we can get just by creating this layer and and uh actually i want to get the cast shadow in the eyes too see that can you can you soften the edge of that i absolutely can now i can layer? either i can soften it by you know using a, a smudge tool which will actually smudge it or I can I can just go in and uh, you know you know draw it and let and, and and soften it with the brush. Now I've laid in the the uh, the pattern for the light here. Now I can go in or for the shadow I should say, but I can go in and create another layer, another clipping mask which I've just done here. And rather than setting that that blend mode they call they're called blend modes rather than setting it to multiply and creating shadows there's one called overlay and overlay actually brightens and heats it up so now i can go in into that local color and go okay i want to i'm going to hit areas now that whoops let me go a little maybe a little bit more warm i can go in and hit areas now that might be really direct in the light. Just heat them up a little bit. There. You say you're working on a movie? Yeah, I'm, I've got uh, Nick and I are working on a, a short film. It's called Snow Bear. We've been, we've been on it, working on it for about five years, but I'm trying hard to get uh, the storyboards done right now. And uh, it's a short film about a, a polar bear uh, in the north, and he can't find, you know, he's looking around, can't find any friends anywhere, wants to make friends and can't find anything, so he makes a snow bear. Did you use white or an eraser to lighten the brown? No, that's the overlay, right? That's the overlay, yeah. So um, I wonder if we should turn on a little cursor right there so people can see. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Where is that? Just click there. Yep, you're right there. Click that's... on. No, the little, actually, the. Nope. Don't presentify? Yep. yep, click on that. Oh, there we go. go. Uh, highlight cursor. 
highlight cursor. Oh, I might have to because. Oh, there we go. Cool. So now you can see it. Sorry, I've been. That's going to be distracting, but well, I'll try it anyway. So, so now what I've got is I've got my basic light and dark pattern, and now I can go right over the top of this, and now I can start. Now I'm going to start adding my reflected light, my changing temperatures, things like that. And uh, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can do this cursor like this. But I'm going to grab. I'm going to grab. Let's see. Well, actually, I like all this green in the background, so I'm going to push this to more green, and then I'm going to maybe bring it up about halfway, and I can do a little reflected light. Now I'm going. To, I'm turning off that presentify. Sorry, guys, it's too distracting. Oh, really? It's super useful to watch. Sorry, it's too distracting. I can't, I can't see what I'm doing. Deactivate. There we go. Whoops. What am I doing? There we go. I did click on the wrong thing. Stop playing my cursor. Uh, there we go. Thank how you. much? How much RAM do you have? I don't know how much RAM do I have, Nick. I that's the next question. I think he's got 128 gigs of RAM, but that's overkill for most people. <laughs> oh god! So what I'm doing now is I'm just going to go in quickly and lightly. Can you explain what you mean by temperature of color? Yeah. So temperature is literally that. You've got warm colors and you've got cool colors. Obviously, blues and greens and violets can be cool. And then your warm colors are your oranges and yellows and reds. And and light tends to fall within that realm of warm and cool. That's where you're... So things that are in a lit area tend to, to be more warm. And then areas in shadow relative to those warm areas are cool. And so that's where I'll go in and... And I'll start pushing some of the color. So here I'm just doing a little rim lighting where I'm getting a little kind of, uh, this is just something I'm making up. Getting a little rim light from some secondary light source in the background, let's say. Now, once again, I want to remind you that I've got a reference image that I started with, but that refer reference image is just the starting point. Look at the lighting we have now, but this is the reference image that I started with. Have you ever tried painting digitally using only one layer? Oh, yeah, I've done that. That's how I, that's how I started dig <laughs> painting digitally, is I, uh, I, didn't use, I, I didn't use the layers. And um, it's uh, it's a mistake. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point. When you're working with that medium, use use all the everything you can with that medium. So here's a here's an example. I'm going to go into the uh, into the. I'm going to grab. I'm grabbing some of the color here on the in the chin, the sh uh, shadow color, and it's giving me this warm value on the on the uh, color picker. But I'm going to jump up to cool, into the cool range. I'm going to lighten that a little bit. And because it's outdoors, he might be reflect, getting a little reflection back on the fur from the sky. So I could go in and cool that fur down and go a little more gray with it. go so here's a uh, an instance of you know adjusting the temperature I'm, I'm going in and pushing the cool temperature of the of the white fur in the shadow areas but then in the in the in the uh, in the hot areas I can go in and 
push the value and the temperature. Like so here I'm going warmer, hotter. Well, it's already pretty warm, so brighter. Someone says, have you saved it? I have not saved it yet. <laughs> I'm just going to go in. Now this, I could sit on this for, and continue working on this for uh, several hours. I'll probably take this through to a little bit more finished. Because like I said, this can go and go and go. Because now that I'm on this layer, this is this is kind of my detail layer. And, and uh, like I said, the, um, you know, reflected light and all that. I can there's get a little reflection of the, the sky and the eyes here and the horizon. How do you know to take that much liberty with the light and shadow? I always worry that mine looks off where it doesn't make sense. I I just don't want to be beholden to what my reference is telling me. I don't like I don't like my reference telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna do whatever I want. And if I have an idea for something, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. And that's the thing. I mean, you can, it's just, you know, if you have enough experience drawing and painting light, because I've, I've done a lot of drawing and painting of it from life, then you can start applying it to your work from your mind. And when you see somebody that knows what they're doing work this way and you can look at the eyes the way they're developing of how great they're looking with the shadow he put over it now he's putting a highlight on the eye uh, and all of the different colors that are in there when you think about doing this traditionally you got to realize that learning how to do this this way is really grown out of this ability to do this in traditional ways. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And we might get a little, you know, if the eye is wet, you get a little bit of wetness highlight in the, in the corners of the eye. And I'm going to put a layer underneath. That's the other great thing. So I've got that highlight layer there. Now I want to go, okay, I want to experiment. Actually, I'm going to go under my shadow layer. Because I have the shadows in there, I'm going to go under the shadow layer. And I'm going to lay in the pupil. But because it's underneath all of that, all underneath the highlights and all that I can there we go so now we got the pupil in there and I haven't messed up my my reflection great I can add some color in there so once again I'll sound like a broken record but you know even if you you know you don't want to make a career or you're not going to use digital painting as illustrations at the very least it's a it's a really great tool for figuring out your traditional work you know if you want to if you if you like to you know plan your and i'm a i'm a stickler for planning planning what i'm going to what i'm going to paint figuring it out you know i've got to have a plan ahead of time before i start to paint and so uh I'm staying on that same layer. So I'm going to go in and darken the inside of the ears. So, you know, at the very least, I, I you, you can use digital painting as a tool to, to create your comps, to figure out, you know, what it is you're going to paint. And, and you can experiment with your compositions and all kinds of stuff. Now, especially because I, I like to do figurative work as well. And um, I just finished up a course 
on uh, dramatic lighting uh, for figures. And I went through and let's see if I can find, um, let's see here real quick. I'm going to go in here, dynamic lighting. Ooh, it's going. Man, everything's moving slow. There we go. Yeah, maybe stop sharing your screen, Dave. I, might no, I got it. It's okay. I'm... Yeah, this one. You know, this was this is a fun one. I did this the same way that I'm I'm showing you, um, the, the process of this of this lion. Uh, it's just a different subject matter, but it was you know laying in the local color, then laying in the shadow, then laying in the highlights. And this one is stylistically different, so it has a different uh, a different end product, but it's it's all the same process. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. And what I saw that you posted this week was, I saw you had a, a model session where you had a model in a dramatic dress. Yes. In your studio, you were working traditionally on a sketch or a study or something. I was, that was, um, we, we did a live about, every quarter, about every three months, we do a live online live class. And so uh, we did a class uh, about a month ago on uh, costumed figure drawing. Um, because one of the things, I mean, we all in art school, if you went to art school, everybody learned how to draw nudes. You went to figure class and you drew your nudes, but then getting out into the real world, when it came time for a practical application, I had, unless I'm working for Playboy magazine or something, I, I rarely had any need to draw nudes. But I and I and I didn't have any experience. I didn't have enough experience drawing clothed models. Yeah, fabrics, fabrics, and, fabrics and things because they didn't they didn't really cover it when I was in school. So I really wanted to start covering that on on my site. Uh, Judy wants to know, do you ever find it almost impossible to replicate what you're doing digital in traditional media? I'm thinking the limitations of print versus digital, painting with pig pigments rather than light, et cetera, might make it difficult to reproduce what you're doing traditionally. Well, I, I, I definitely keep in mind the medium that I'm, uh, if I'm doing this for a comp, I'll keep in mind what I'm doing it for. Uh, and I know that, you know, once I jump over, to um, my traditional media, it's going to it's going to take a, on a life of its own. Matter of fact, let me show you something. I want to show you my hippo. Let's see if I can pull this up really quick. Um, the oil painting. Yeah, I want to show the oil, but I also want to show the comp. And I think I have the comp somewhere. I hope. I have got a hippo painting that I did. Or a friend. Here we go. Hippo, hippo, hippo. Not that one. <laughs> uh, here we go. Hold on. I'm sorry. I just want to show you this. How do you set up your Wacom like that? You built a custom frame for it, right? I did. Yeah, this is a... I, I built the stand for it. But I want to show you this. This is a digital painting. So I had um, a few years ago, uh, I had someone commission me to do a, a hippo painting. And so once again, because I was doing a commission, working digitally was great because I, I did I did like three or four different comps like this. I sent them to the client and they picked this one. And then this was what I used as my main reference, along with my photographic reference, to do my oil painting. So, um, so once again, that's another advantage of working digitally. So this is a, a sketch that I did digitally uh, of the hippo. And then let me see if I can find. If you search hippo oil, you'll probably find it. But there. And then here, there's the finished oil painting. There you go. And so. And then once again, this is a, an example of, you know, I still paint traditional as well, but doing, doing that, that digital comp first was such 
a, a lifesaver for time. I didn't have to go back and forth with the client. Um, so it, it worked out really great. So that's another example of being able to, you know, use Wonderful. your digital painting. That was really cool. Was it hard for you to transition to digital work and which, which do you prefer to do now? It wasn't hard because of the meat, the tools. So using a Wacom Cintiq is uh, really, really helpful. Being able to use, having, I'm a firm believer in having the right tools. And, um, you know, it's like building a house with a handsaw instead of a, you know, a circular saw, you know, it, it, an electric circular saw. It's just, it's just better and, and easier. And so I try to do, I try to get the right tools for the job. And so, you know, that thinking really enabled me to, to kind of make the transition a lot more easily. And I, I still prefer, you know, I don't know that I prefer any of it. I love it all. You know, to me, digital drawing and painting is just another medium. It's just another way of expressing. I, I like it as much as sitting down and doing a watercolor painting. They just satisfy different, you know, different itches at the time. You know, I get the itch to do a, a oil painting or I get the itch to do a watercolor and I'll do it. And now, I for me, I think the digital side of things, it's, it's when I have to get an idea out, a visual idea out, and I got to do it qu quick and, uh, and easily, then I'll jump over digitally. And I know one of the things you've mentioned, but, you know, you had the advantage when you were at Disney is you said, you know, I need to learn to draw digitally. So I need a, a Wacom Cintiq and I need Photoshop and it was on your desk the next day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was, yeah, that's one of the advantages of working for a, a company where money is no object. So if you're, you know, I, to Aaron's point, I think having the right tools for the job absolutely is the way to go. But if, you know, a 32 inch Cintiq could be cost prohibitive for yeah. some people. Yeah. You it, know, you Wacom, Wacom makes a number of different sizes. They've got, I think they go all the way down as far as 13 inches, 16 might be their smallest now. I can't remember, but they've got 16, 20, 22, 24, 32 inches, or, you know, an iPad actually works great now. If you, if you get an iPad with that Apple pencil, it's pretty darn close to a Cintiq now. And it's, it's, you know, it's a bit more, budget friendly overall right so those are options as well for people that are looking to experiment with this um something to consider so here i'm just going in uh into the shadow areas into the highlight areas and i'm pushing lights and darks and and uh you know in the in the bright areas i'll, I'll hit highlights you know in here or maybe some of the fur is catching a little more light so i'll hit that and it's that you know it's adding texture it's adding temperature like i was talking about before and i really it's just be, it becomes a whole this is what i do to finish out the painting the other thing that's cool you know i've already established the background right now the, the cat feels a little small in the image so i'll just highlight those layers that i've been using for the cat itself and i can leave the background and i can go edit and uh let's see i've got all of those edit Tran free transform path i don't know what that means but we're just going to go boom look at that I can, I can independently resize the cat and there we go you should zoom in on the the eyes and stuff so they can see sort of the brushy nature you know when it's yeah tight, oops. Well, actually, there's another, uh, the shadows, you know, if you feel you can adjust things too. like, sometimes I'll take a shadow layer, like, and I'll go, you know, it's not quite dark enough. And I'll double it up. And that's obviously too dark. But I can go in and I can adjust that, you know, and play with it. Maybe make it a little bit, just a little bit darker or whatever. I think it's okay the way it is. But, you know, you can, that's the beauty of working digitally is you can, uh, you can play with it. You can go in and, and, and do different things with it. It's very, very adjustable, especially when you're working, uh, when you're working, uh, uh, with layers. People are saying they find it interesting that you call this a sketch. 
Oh, this is very sketchy because I've, I've got other ones that are very finished. Well, that's why I was saying maybe if you zoom and pan, they'll get an idea of sort of a texture. That's yeah, you can. Oh, here. that's a little too much. But yeah, you can see that this is still pretty sketchy. It feels very organic. Yeah. Nice. And that's the key. I try to, I, I try not to really tighten up. I try to keep everything um, as loose and lively as I can. It gives, it keep, it gives the, uh, the piece life, you know. Well, Aaron, I think that we've taken up your whole day here. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm pretty good. much, I'm pretty much taking it as far as I, I'm going to take it with you guys. Be, um, although I'm, there's nothing new I'm going to show you other than just sitting here, drawing for the next three hours. So, <laughs> so, but well, you can see how quickly we were able to get, you know, a, a somewhat decent sketch and even this you could use as a comp to go in and, and show a client or use for your painting well so, and for artists looking at this and, and wondering how this applies to them uh i think it's pretty easy and that is that the basic skills of drawing and painting are all right here they're all in the the same uh world of imaging it's just that the way you build this in a in a computer is markedly different. It's yeah, you just you're working within the confines of the medium, and yeah, this is just a, a different new, medium. It's a whole yeah, new medium. It's just it's a, a different medium, medium, just like anything else. And like I said, yeah. think of it as a big fancy pencil or a big fancy paintbrush, because that's really all it is. Because you're still doing, you're still doing the work. You're just doing it, you know, with a different medium. Like and what I was hoping. Uh, in the workshop out in this fall in Dubois, Wyoming, uh, what I'm hoping is that people who come will have a chance to work with you in more traditional mediums and get some hands-on training and ability to work with you uh, to improve those skills. Yeah. So that so that they could possibly, uh, you know, learn the skill like this and. Um, eventually grow into this and of course coming out there when you're there in person uh we have some programs also that will, will where you will do be doing an evening program that shows people a, a wide assortment of stuff that you've done and worked on but uh, if you go to aaron's uh website that's the best source of of just getting a feel for what this guy can do because it's pretty cool yeah our website is creatureartteacher.com and uh i just posted the slide again for everybody if you're interested in painting and drawing along with aaron in person in september in wyoming it's going to be a great opportunity uh go to uh skbworkshop.com um and uh you can learn more uh, what are the dates again it's september is it 12th? What's when does it start, David? Right in the middle of the month. So I think it's 12th to 18th. 12th to 18th. And it's out in Wyoming, beautiful Wyoming. Won't be too cold yet. <laughs> Just starting to get there, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Actually, I think it's snowed out there this week. Ah. And uh, but uh, if you're coming to the workshop, uh, you want to get there for Sunday night because Sunday night is the kickoff and uh, everybody comes in early. That's when you register. It's really, it's a group of people from all over the world. And um, it's just a great place. And it's a little one horse town up in high country of Wyoming. Beautiful, beautiful country. And we just spend a whole week doing artsy stuff. Which is all there right with me. There we it's go. All it is, it's artsy stuff. So, uh, Connect with us on the skbworkshop.com or the SKB website and um, and with uh, Aaron on his website and check out his Facebook. Aaron has a, a trip coming up. Uh, he and Nick are going all over Europe. Uh, yeah, actually, if I, we might have some Europeans listening right now. So go to our website and uh, um, you know check out our schedule to see if we're coming near you. Yeah, I'm posting those slides now briefly because I don't want to don't want to uh, overwhelm 
this what this event is about but uh i was just informed actually that these workshops in in europe are already nearly sold out so uh if you're interested and you're in europe uh you know we hope to see you join us there but uh check it out uh go to creatureartteacher.com but definitely uh check out skbworkshop.com for this event in september i think it's going to be great david thank you for setting this up i really appreciate it thank you no, thank you aaron for coming on and, and and letting us pick your brain and see what you how you work and everything and it's a pleasure to see and i hope everybody enjoyed it i hope so and um you know even if if, if, if you can find the opportunity um and and try digital art try your hand at it i really recommend it and uh it's just it's such a fun medium to get into and there's no reason to be scared of it and uh yeah just just dive in so hopefully we'll see you guys in september okay Absolutely. guys thank you all for showing up and um we're gonna cut off the stream now and go about our day hope you do too go get a pad and pencil and try to draw something yeah go draw take a screen take a <laughs> screenshot right now of this lion's head and give it a try try to draw this line see how that works right on drawing and drawing is the key <laughs> thanks Thank everybody Bye. thank you aaron thank you thanks everybody we will see you next time have a great have day. day bye now <laughs>